All right, some coaches being dismissed. And are we getting closer to an Alabama-Georgia SEC championship game? It feels like that every year. Welcome into Up to the Second College Football Season 3, Episode 12. It's presented by Academy Sports and Outdoors. Enter for your chance to win a $10,000 Academy gift card plus SEC championship game tickets just by signing into the Academy app. The ultimate SEC football sweepstake runs from October the 8th through November the 18th. Odds depend on the entries received. Again, it ends on November the 18th. You can find complete rules at academy.com slash official dash rules. All right, so on the show, Adam Rittenberg of ESPN joins me. We're going to break down all things college football, but of course, we're going to talk about what happened there with Texas A&M and Jimbo Fisher moving on. And uh, Billy and Caroline have all the big storylines in the SEC. It's up to the second college football. Need a new grill? Academy Sports and Outdoors is the destination for your outdoor cooking needs. With our free in-store assembly and pre-assembled grills and smokers, buy online at academy.com and pick up in-store. So keep those grilling plants at Academy Sports and Outdoors. All right, our next guest has been all over the Jimbo Fisher story and Texas A&M's future are there on ESPN. Adam Rittenberg joining us here on Up to the Second. Adam, how you been, bud? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So, I don't want to say, were you surprised by the Jimbo firing? Because I think any time a coach doesn't live up to expectations, a firing does happen. But maybe surprised it happened when it happened. Yeah, I mean, it was one of those that I think you had to always be watching. Um, but certainly the timing you know, came as a bit of a shock uh, because it was such a big buyout. But here's the thing, and thinking about it more, and maybe we should have been in this mindset um, prior to the decision, that you look at the out years, the 2024, 2025, it wasn't like this thing was going to go down to $15 million. Like it was going to be an expensive move whenever they decided to do it. And I think in, in college athletics, even though it's run in such a emotional and kind of wild, crazy way, one thing that's clear is that when you know it's not going to work, you can't keep going. You have to pivot. You have to change direction. And I think there was enough evidence um, especially since the 2020 season, David, that once uh, that it wasn't going to work with Jimbo, they weren't going to win a national championship. They weren't going to win an SEC title. And so at that point, um, I think I understand, even though it was incredibly expensive, historic uh, in that sense, why they pivoted to, um, you know, making the change that they did. Adam, the, the funny part is while I agreed with the initial contract, I did scratch my head at the extension, but it made sense at the time. Um, maybe not the extension itself, but the raise made sense to me. And I'm looking at this, these numbers, 2031, my sons are sophomores in high school. They'll be out of college when that contract was supposed to be done. Yeah, it, it, you know, I kind of joked, it's like the Jim Bonilla contract. It's, uh, you know, it's the Bobby Bonilla contract for football. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's the most glaring example, but certainly not the only example of what happens when you emotionally spend. I mean, you know, if, if you or I um, ran our, our personal expenses or really like any of these folks, maybe, maybe they're rich enough that they can do this. But if, if we ran our personal expenses, like donors run college athletics and um, departments, especially spending around coaches salaries, we'd all be broke. I mean, that it just it's just a crazy way to live your life. Um, but this is what happens when you um, when, when you're driven by the emotion and the possibility of, of championships. And that certainly was motivating and understandably so for Texas A&M on the front end. I'm with you probably less so on the second time around. In some ways, it's it's those extensions, not the initial contracts that get schools in big trouble. And certainly was the case here for A&M with Jimbo. It was the case with Auburn, with Gus Malzahn. You know, the idea of losing a coach, especially to a competitor, in the SEC, in this case, it would have been LSU. In that case, it would have been Arkansas. Is so painful for some folks that they'd rather just throw money at the problem or at the potential problem, the situation, and deal with the consequences on the back end. And that that's the typical pattern of behavior I've observed in covering college football and in covering the coaching carousel is that there's just such a fear of of, of what happens if this coach leaves us for another school in the SEC, how are we even going to wake up in the morning? The, the, the truth is you'll be fine. And I think more, more of these coaches need greater self-esteem. Like your program is still pretty great, regardless who the head coach is. They want to leave. That's their right. We will be okay. There's less of that thinking in my mind, um, David, uh, because there's just such a fear of, oh my God, we lost our coach to fill in the blank. Adam, I, I do want to go back to that for one quick second, because remembering what it felt like in 2021, August of 2021, 
a and had come off that 2020 Orange Bowl season, um, and the fear of of Jimbo going to LSU was real. And at that point, it felt like you're ascending, you're ascending, you're ascending. Unfortunately for a and they ascended, and then came that steep cliff. They did, and uh, and. And it really was uh, kind of a one-year deal. Um, and what's so what's so ironic about that was that was a season where it was an all-SEC schedule. And there certainly were some factors in 2020 that, um, you know, we were obviously different from many, many other seasons. But the fact is, that was a really good team that uh, held its own in a very tough conference. And it was a deserving top five team that year. But they just never were able to harness that going forward. And despite the recruiting, despite the money, despite the NIL efforts, they weren't able to get back to the, that place or really remotely back to that place. And so that's why um, they decided to make this move when they did and reset still with a lot of good players, still with a lot of the um, things that have made Texas A&M a position to compete, even though they haven't for a long time. And they're going to try it with a new coach. So who do you think that new coach might be? I know there's those wish lists out there, and I look at the Mississippi State wish list. Some of them seem to be some of the same names because there's only one huge opportunity right now. We'll see how the, the rest of the uh, season plays out. What do you think? What do you, what do you think's the right fit for A&M that is realistic? Right. I think it's somebody who really has a vision for roster building. Instead of just you – know, it, it's, it's tough in college football because – Sometimes when you have access to the best talent, then the 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 um the knee jerk is just to grab whatever you can. And I think what happened at AM was they, because they had that ability, they just grabbed the talent instead of thinking, does this person really fit here? Is this person uh going to, to work in our culture, make us a better program? So I think it's somebody who has that vision. Um, I, I do think it will matter this time around, David, have somebody a little bit more connected to the program. I know that hasn't been the case uh, you know, in the past at times. Certainly wasn't the case with Jimbo. Um, really had not been in that state or or uh, around the Texas A&M program before he got the job. But I, you know, the two names that jump to mind are not surprising in Mike Elko and Jeff Trailer, and that both of them uh, would would be, you know, I think a lot more comfortable maybe walking in the door to that situation, especially for Mike. He'd been there. Um, he did a good job as a, an a and assistant defensive coordinator. He understands the place and the pressure and all of that. And then Jeff Trailer, I think, would just be a huge hit for that community. Um, he's a guy who connects with people from from Texas, anywhere in Texas, but especially um, East Texas. And then uh, I don't think there's a college coach even Mac Brown, who is more popular among the high school coaches in the state of Texas than Jeff Trailer does. Does that mean, you know, you still have to recruit other places. You still have to be active in the transfer portal. But I, I think that A&M would have a real uh, opportunity to be the top recruiting operation in the state of Texas if they went with somebody like that. I know Dan Lanning made it pretty clear last night he's not coming there. Um, certainly there's other candidates uh, that, that 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 are notable. But one thing that that, that works against AM here, I think, especially when you're talking about, you know, Kalen DeBoer or even a Dabo Sweeney, I know he was asked about it today, is that you're asking coaches to leave programs that have proven to win championships and compete nationally much more recently than AM has. So you're asking them to take that leap of faith. And you certainly can offer all the things that AM can, and very few programs can do that, but you can't say, hey, listen, we can win here. See, maybe we can win here, but he knows at if you're Kalen DeBoer or Dan Lanning or Dabo Sweeney, you know you can win where you're at. You don't know for sure if you can win in College Station. Adam, you know, when I'm in the preseason thinking about scenarios out there, I thought, all right, Michigan's probably going to win the national championship. Jim Harbaugh is going to leave on a high note and go to the NFL because that's what I think he's wanted to do the last couple of years, right? That might still happen, but maybe for different reasons. So uh, do you think Jim Harbaugh is at Michigan next year? Well, if he wants to be, I mean, that's the thing people need to realize, like, you know, even if they get hit with you know, horrible violations, Michigan has taken a position that Jim Harbaugh is their guy. Their president, Santa Ono, is the biggest Harbaugh fan on the campus probably right now. Um, fans want him there. The uh, the administration, I know there's been some friction, but they have gotten behind him amid all that's gone on here with the Big Ten suspension. And I think Jim Harbaugh loves this in a weird way. He's the type of guy that loves to have everybody against you. He like probably loves the Michigan versus everybody um, shirts and beanies that the players are wearing now. And the fact that, um, you know, that, that they're, that they're rising above this controversy. 
Uh, so I, I think in, in some ways he's probably likelier to remain at Michigan than maybe he was when things were going great because he certainly um, had an interest in getting back to the NFL. I don't think that interest has gone anywhere. But the thing that everyone needs to remember is the NFL team has to say yes. And there's other options in the NFL. There's other options in college football. And there's really not very many NFL jobs relative to college jobs every year. Maybe you get to five or six. So if those people have uh, candidates internal or coordinators or what what have you, you know, if, if they hire those guys, there's no room for Jim Harbaugh. So I think with the jobs that are likely to open this year, there's a pretty good chance. We already know there's one open in Vegas. Um, Chargers, I think, will open. The Bears, I think, will open. All those are possibilities for Jim Harbaugh, but it doesn't mean he's going to get it. So I, I, I would still go with Michigan versus the NFL as the likelier destination for Harbaugh in 2024. Adam, last thing for you, Georgia, Tennessee this weekend. Am I being a prisoner of the moment, or has Tennessee been a huge disappointment this year considering I knew they weren't going to have Hendon Hooker. I didn't think they were going to have the success that they had last year, but I also didn't expect for Missouri to make the leap that they made. Well, I think Missouri's really good. I mean, that, that, that's the, I think Missouri, and you could ask people at Georgia, Kirby Smart was very complimentary of them. I think they've taken a significant step. You know, that was a program that was better defensively last year. They really moved in the right direction on that side of the ball. And then the quarterback play took a big jump this year with Brady Cook. Um, the running back Schrader has been outstanding. Luther Burden is an All-America candidate at receiver. And I talked with Eli Drinkwitz a few days ago, and he said, you know, those are guys that can change the game. And we didn't have that before. So and their defense has continued to ascend. And certainly the performance last week was was disappointing for Tennessee and, um, you know, a little bit of a reality check of where they're at right now. And uh, if they were to struggle against Georgia, I I think some of that early Josh Heupel buzz is going to die down a bit. But um, they did lose a lot of really good players. Let's just be real. I mean, they lost great players at quarterback, at receiver, offensive line. Their defense still isn't quite where where they they want it to be in the future. So um, I still think Josh Heupel is doing a heck of a job. But I also give Missouri a lot of credit. Right now, you could make a case, um, and I know LSU beat them, but uh, you could say Missouri has an argument to be the third best team in the SEC, if not the fourth, um, right behind LSU. Adam, appreciate your time, man. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. At Academy Sports and Outdoors, bikes for the whole family are just a click away. Buy online at academy.com with our free in-store assembly. Your next set of wheels plus helmets, pads, and water bottles will be waiting for you at our in-store pickup counter. Get to the fun faster with our in-store pickup and free assembly at Academy Sports and Outdoors. By the magic of television and uh, internet streaming, here are Billy and Caroline from the similar studio, similar setup, but a different conversation. Welcome into Up to the Second, brought to you by Academy. He's Billy Lucci. I am Caroline Fenton. Let's start with the news of the week that you broke, Billy, on Sunday. Texas A&M parting ways with Jimbo Fisher. News that wasn't necessarily the most shocking to me, but was shocking (laughs) after it came from, you know, Texas A&M dropping 50 plus on Mississippi State. Uh, but I understand that it's it's high expectations that just simply have not been met. Now it's looking ahead to a more difficult SEC with Texas coming into the SEC where the expectation isn't just let's go eight and four and nine and three. It's let's get to Atlanta and let's win the national championship. Yeah, no question. I mean, <clears throat> it's timing matters in this thing and and yeah. and, and time matters. You know, timing in terms of the price of poker is going up in the SEC. Um, But time in in terms of six years, you know, A&M was six years into it. And they're trying to project and look ahead and say, you know, where where was this thing trending? What was the trajectory? And I was telling someone the other day, like, the real – debate and, and even I early in the year were saying it and, I, and you know, this was if it didn't turn around on the field and they had a chance to turn it around on the field. And I know like, Hey, injuries were rough. And when, when you have them at quarterback, um, but the, the counter there would be, well, they have an injury or even two, sometimes three every single year. So what, what you know, what's the issue, but even without Connor Wigman, who was trending, you know, arrow just straight up, 
in terms of in the SEC, a young star quarterback. Even with that, they had chances, outstanding chances to beat Alabama, a down Alabama. I know they don't look like it now, but they 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 are still and were them. LSU last year and Bama this year, those two teams to win the West. I've been covering this a long time now, um, Caroline. Like mm-hmm. this is year twelve in this conference. Um, I know AM feels like a newbie still, but they're not. This is a dozen years in. They were only into the they were only in the Big 12 for 16 years. I mean, we're already coming up on the same amount of time. Mm-hmm. These are probably, if I had to rank three worst SEC West, or, or, or not worst, like three. The three beatable. least, yeah, the three most beatable, least dominant SEC West champs since since I've been doing this. There might have been an Auburn team in there, uh, right? Did Stidham win the West one year in Auburn? But there was an there was an Auburn team in there, not not the Nick Marshall, uh, not that national title, you know, contending team. But there was another Auburn team in there, and then probably these two. To me, those are probably the three. I don't even know if there was another Auburn team, but those are probably the three mm-hmm. uh, worst I've seen so far uh, win the West. These last two. So my point is the opportunity has been there for a and The opportunity was there this year. We watched the Tennessee game. We saw how that played out. How 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 pedestrian does Tennessee look right now? After, I mean, they, you know. Well, and I got embarrassed against Missouri. That kind of, I they wanna, did. I want to <laughs> talk about them for a minute later. Yeah. But yeah, but. You, you see that Tennessee game. You saw how winnable the, the Alabama game was. You saw what happened in Oxford where they lose on a final play. They had their opportunities to turn it around, and we could be talking about a team that's like seven and, or six and one in the SEC right now. And Even that, five and two, he's not fire. And I think at a certain point, you have to start looking around at what other coaches in the league, in the sport are doing and look at Jimbo Fisher and say, well, when are you going to do that? At what point are you going to be able to get us to Atlanta or to get us to a certain point? I look at Brian Kelly getting to the SEC championship in year one. And yeah, of course, that was ahead of schedule. But in year two, it still looks like LSU is obviously not a national championship contending team. They're not a team that's going anywhere. Josh Heupel at Tennessee in year two, Tennessee was the number one ranked team in the country for a week. They had the number one offense Mm -hmm. in the country. They had a path to the college football playoff and both. And, uh, you know, Billy Napier, I know struggling in year two, Florida might not make a bowl game, but I think Florida fans at least feel encouraged with the way that that recruiting is going. I'm leaving. I'm leaving Napier. I'm leaving Napier off. He's in a now. different category, different <laughs> but category than those two. Absolutely. But, but, but you look at Lane A&M Kiffin. Has, Lane you Kiffin, Lane the fact that Ole Miss games. has now surpassed Texas A&M. And mm-hmm. that's not a disrespect to Ole Miss, but Ole Miss has never been in the class of the Alabamas, the LSUs, and the A&Ms of the SEC West. And yeah. Ole Miss is doing it with less money and less talent than Texas A&M has available. I think that's the other kicker, too, is you got every resource in the world. You've got fan buy-in. You've got uh, you've got financial resources. You've got some of the best facilities in the country. You have got a fan base that will support you to the very end. That is what more could you ask for as a college football coach? You need more than, you know, getting beat by the best teams in the conference and beating the teams that you're supposed to, at some point you need to be beating, you need to become that team that is the best in the conference. That's consistently contending for an sec championship. And that's, that's ultimately, I think why you move on from Jimbo Fisher that in year six, if you can't do it, not now, then when? Yeah. In year six. And it wasn't, it wasn't trending better. Was this a better football team this year than they had last year? No question about it. There's so much more competitive that you you can go through every one of those games, save Miami, even, even Miami, it got away from them there, but you know, Miami's not that good. Tennessee is not that good. Ole Miss has a good record. They haven't really done anything. They've beaten, they've beaten uh, LSU in a shootout, which LSU engages in a lot of shootouts. They just happen to lose that one. I mean, I, th- so the best thing they've done this year is beat a three loss LSU team there. It was there for the taking in year six in, and even in year five, 
if you'd have built the program that, that A&M expected, that Jimbo expected. And there was a point in time where it was trending towards that, and it really looked like that. And it was year three, and they won. Not They were 9-1. and one. They won the Orange Bowl. They finished in the top five. They were a true playoff contender. Yeah. And then the following season, uh, I've been saying this and saying this, so I'm going to cut it short, but the following season they were ranked number 11 at this time two years ago. And then they lost Ole Miss, lost to LSU, and they haven't got it back since. The, and the, more importantly, it didn't look like they were getting it back. And I think folks were worried about what was going to happen in the portal on December 4th. There were a lot of rumblings around here. Um, you know, donor support in the form of NIL was was starting to go like, you know, once you lose that confidence and then you start having a harder time, you know, what are we going to be able to provide Jimbo to help him win this coming season in, in year seven? And uh, I think they realized that, hey, the contract's the contract and we're just going to have to swallow it and it sucks, but we're going to have to do it and we're going to be, you know, taking a big financial hit for a few years. It is what it is. And, and once they decided that, that they had the money, not raised up, not they didn't go around and raise it, but that A&M had the money and they had the funds and the department, the, the athletic department, the 12th man foundation could withstand it. Then that, that was it. Um, what's interesting now to me, and what, by the way, Caroline, what I told people is it, it's just hard because I tried to understand both sides of the, the argument, keep him, fire him. I tried to listen, think on my own without influence other people. The yeah. hardest part was the, the keep him side seemed to really hinge on the contract and how it was going to affect the next hire. And, and, and did they have the money? And then the second part of it seemed to be like, let's, you know, maybe, maybe things could turn around with one more year. Yeah. And when those are, that means you're not focusing on saying, Hey, this trajectory, if you look at it down the road, it's pointing to a turnaround in championships when that's not, when you can't really go down that road. And then on the other side of it, they can just present you with mountains of evidence that just, here's the reality. Here's what's happening on the field. Here's, you know, it's just, it's too hard. It's too hard to deny. So they make the decision. Um, the firing of Jimbo will affect who they hire. Um, it doesn't mean they can't go spend a boatload of money in a King's ransom if the right guy comes up. But it, I think, you know, it certainly makes you lean towards them not, you know, backing up the Brinks truck on this one and maybe find, you know, if the possibility is there and it's like, man, this guy's pretty good. But he's now going to cost nine million to get him versus this guy. We think is going to be really good, but he's not. You know, he hasn't got a chance to prove it yet, and he's also going to be a lot cheaper. I think you're going to see A&M go. You mentioned Napier, and I, I think you'd see A&M go like that type of route, uh, unless. And I don't want to discourage Aggies because I, I feel like it, it, people get discouraged and they think, "Oh, we're going on the cheap." I'm not saying they're, they're going. If if somebody popped up that's attainable. Like if, if Kalen DeBoer at Washington is attainable, I think you see AM go guns blazing after him. Now, if they Absolutely. interviewed him, if they interviewed him and, and and something wasn't right or they thought he was getting used for, you know, whatever. But I mean, if that's a real candidate and you can get him, I think you would absolutely see AM go down that road to, and I, and I think they ultimately will. I mean, they might get, a, a, you know, a hundred yards down that path and go, this is he's actually not attainable um, in terms of he's not leaving or he's going to the NFL or whatever. But yeah, they would go after him. And I think if you could get a deal done with someone like that, they absolutely would. Or if there's some coach out there, you know, I don't think it's Dabo, but like a Dabo, a Lincoln Riley, like like somebody like Jimbo, where it's just like, Caroline, you're not gonna like me here and saying this, but like a I'm not saying AM would hire him, but like a Brian Kelly a Dabo, yeah. a Lincoln, where you can tell in the case of Dabo, you could just tell there's a lot of frustration in those other two guys. You can just get this vibe that they are not a fit. And I know it came out this morning, Brian Kelly, there are rumors of him. If Michigan opens up, maybe going there and mm -hmm. look, yeah, 
we can say, why would you leave LSU? Well, why would Lincoln leave OU? Why would Jimbo leave Florida? So it it happens, so we got to be wary of it. But unless there's someone like that, you know, and you never know if, if one of these guys is like, hey, I want out. I hate it here. Then, then that will change the equation for AM. But I think their current trajectory is towards the guys like, in, in my opinion, I think the, you know, trailers, at UTSA, the Elkos at Dukes of, of, of that, of the world in, in that realm, like Leipold at Kansas. And I'm, again, I'm not saying because I've heard interest, the interest level has been off the freaking charts from college, NFL, it not big be? names. I promise you, your boy Lane would crawl from Oxford to college station for this job. Um, no matter what, what is said, and you're getting a lot of coaches that are posturing saying, we won't come, we won't take it. And most of the ones that say that would. Um, well, Nick Saban said he wasn't leaving the NFL for Alabama. We know true. how that turned true. out. Brian Kelly Who, said he wasn't leaving Notre Dame. He is not at Notre Dame. So coaches say a lot of things. Now the one, the, yeah. I was going to say the one that that is not lying is Dan Lanning. Okay. Dan Lanning everybody no one understands what his buyout is everybody thinks it's 20 million he's also and enough people know it people that tell me are like oh but you know keep that people know it and i don't know what the secret is everyone in coaching understands like dan lanning's got like a, a separate deal with with nike it, you're talking about like a extra add an extra 25 30 million to that buyout it's somewhere between 40 and 50 just to get him away from Oregon. Plus he's very happy there. So what would you have to pay? He's out. He's not an option for A&M. He wouldn't be an option for LSU. If Kelly left, he's not an option for Michigan. Like that is otherworldly money. And he's happy there. Um, so I, I think he's probably the one that when you hear people say I'm out, I'm not interested. That would be the one to, to pay attention to and believe. And I also think kind of putting in the same, I want to hear your thoughts on it. Cause I kind of put this coach in the same category as Dan Lanning is Mike Norvell is Mike yeah. Norvell's gone through the trials and tribulations of being a new coach and inheriting a down program where for a, you know, last year, at the beginning of last year, I thought Mike Norvell was going to be on the hot seat because Florida State didn't look very good. Yeah. But Mike Norvell did the recruiting, went into the transfer portal, did the dirty work for the first couple of years. And now he has Florida State as a as a college football playoff contender. As a coach, I don't know why you would want to leave that other than money. No. Yeah. I've seen a coach leave Florida State to go to Texas A&M before. Mm -hmm. The Tallahassee to Texas pipeline is, is strong. But I think it's also the idea of, look, I did my work. I, I got this this program to a point yeah. where I want it to be. Dan Lanning the same way and money for Dan Lanning. That I think that it's like, look, I, I built something here. I like what I've built here. No coach would be starting over at Texas A&M because you would be walking into a program of riches, both financially and recruiting wise. But I think that a coach would look at a coach like a Norvell or a Dan Lanning that has it pretty sweet where it is right now would look at it and say, money's great. The program's great. The fan base is great. The opportunity is great. What I have, I think, is is pretty great, too. And I, do I think, think that's what you run in with, with Dan Campbell, too. People, Aggies, you know, everywhere want to ask Dan Campbell, Dan Campbell. Uh, it would be so hard to hire a, a successful, trending up NFL coach away yeah. to begin with. But Dan, it, much like you're talking about Norvell at Florida State, Dan went to Detroit. They gave him his first shot. Um, and he's built and he's on the verge of something incredible up there. Something that, that, that entire city will never forget, you know, and, and that's been waiting on for 30, 35 years, you know, almost their entire existence. Yeah. And he's bonded to that like emotionally. And, and so from the get go, I said, that would just be, it, it feels like a no go. And I still firmly believe that, but you're talking about with Norvell, I'd heard, you know, he was absolutely kind of looking at AM as like, hey, if that thing comes up like a year ago, he's locked into Florida State now. And for yeah. the reasons you said, and that's also 
goes along with with what I've heard. But I think you bring up a great point with Norvell. He's coming over from Memphis, and it took him a couple years, and he got it rolling. I think A and M could go that same path. The difference is if you hire the right damn guy, Caroline. And this is my my message to the A and M decision makers, and and I'm telling everyone I can this. If you if you underestimate what the right guy could do immediately here, and you're looking two, three, four years down the road, then I think you're 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 missing the boat here. You can get both. You can get a guy that can build and sustain a program and does it the right way, and, and the foundation is solid and the structure and you know, you can you can do that and find the guy that within 48 hours to, to a week or so can convince every not every so you, no one's going to do that. That can convince the majority of the key players returning to this program to stay. Yeah. And and fire up the, the donor base enough that NIL starts to visibly climb. And then that guy can go into the portal equipped with with a, you know, with an all, you know, just a treasure chest and go in there and get a handful of players out of the portal that are legit, you can do in year one what it took Norvell to do in, what is it, year three or four? Which year is it for him there? Year three? Year three, right? Yeah. Four, I believe. Four, okay. Year whatever four. whatever year, year you're three in, or four. you could do in year one what Norvell's doing right now with the right hire. There are plenty of good coaches that could end up winning at A&M, but if you lose a ton of players the first week on the job, um, you're gonna you're not gonna be in a rebuild. But in terms of the SEC and immediate contention, you're setting that back a year, if not a couple of years. Whereas, if you get the right guy, he could come in and win absolutely day one. And I know there are some big names out there that could come in and do that, but they're also you know, I don't think Texas A&M needs to, and I know it's popular on Facebook and, you know, Facebook, I, I don't know what world some of these Facebook people live Facebook on. Facebook is but a I see, terrifying place. I see people that even know what the, I would think, know what they're talking about. They say some of the weirdest shit. I can't even, and, and a lot of them are even like former A&M players where I go, what, what on earth? But like. Just wait until they start uh, flight Lane, tracking. That's my favorite Lane, time of a coaching uh, search. By the way, A&M Zoom calling interviews you know there's i'm not saying that ross bjork's not going to hop on a plane at some point but it's not going to be an obvious one that you catch and then number two it's also you know they're smart enough to drive to houston and fly out from fbos around houston or go up to you know central texas somewhere and do it um and it's not going to be an a&m university plane and then the other thing is there's a thing called zoom now they're going to do a lot of them via Zoom. You're not going to flight track. You know, 2020 changed things uh, on the coaching search front. Right. Um, but where I, was, where I was going is there's a couple coaches out there and the Facebook goes crazy, but I, I don't think they're going to go after somebody like Lane Kiffin or Deion Sanders. Um, they're not rolling the dice like Ole Miss and, and Colorado can. And I know people go, what are you talking about? Well, Deion's entirely unproven. Out, you know, and and I, I like some of the things Dion builds his program off of. And the, I think at the root and the core of it, he's he he preaches the right message to his players. And and but again, you're not hiring Dion after one year at Colorado, and you're not high. And he would, you know, he this that's the one year he'd probably want to wait a year because of his family anyway. And you're not going Lane Kiffin. I know people think so, and I know Lane wants a job, but you're not going there. So, but there are other guys that could walk in here and keep this thing together and win right away. So, I think the decision makers at AM, if they're not factoring that in as a, as a legitimate possibility and something that they're striving for, I think they're going about it the wrong way. And I think in these interviews, even with these under, not under the radar, but not the, you know, one billion dollar candidates you need to interview them and really dig into like what's your staff going to look like do you know what does it look like with elijah robinson who's holding this thing together tremendously and then decide what's your best option for a guy walking in here and keeping this thing intact because if he does you can get it rolling right away and you don't have to be like steve sarkeesian and go five and seven 
in year one in Austin or like Norvell. And you can be more like Brian Kelly at LSU. And I always tend to think that the sexy name that gets thrown around in coaching searches is usually not even close to the candidates that that school is actually pursuing. I remember when mm-hmm. Les Miles got fired in 2016, Tom Herman was the name that everybody oh, yeah was going after everyone thought that Tom Herman was going to LSU. Everyone associated Tom Herman with LSU. And of course, Ed Orgeron gets the job. Tom Herman gets the job at Texas. I'm very publicly flirting with both LSU and Texas. And obviously, yeah. as we know, Tom Herman was not very successful at no. Texas. That Sometimes there are these young up and coming names that everyone thinks is going to be the next it thing. And they're really not for whatever reason. And on the other hand, I think that what we've seen with Texas A&M and Jimbo Fisher is that slam dunk, expensive, flashy hire that makes every headline on every sports network in America. That's not always a proven thing either. So Mm -hmm. whenever Dabo's name gets thrown around in every single coaching search, his name was thrown around in LSU's coaching search whenever they parted ways with Ed Orgeron. Yeah. I uh, did, did Dabo Sweeney just luck into two of the best quarterbacks in the history of college football and Deshaun Watson and Trevor Lawrence, or is he a really good identifier and developer of talent and a great tactician? I think we've yeah. seen this year, maybe he did just luck into two great quarterbacks that you can't always let the resume of a coach maybe overshadow what you might know about that coach. And I think with Jimbo Fisher, yeah. maybe Texas A&M fans learned that, hey, we tried the proven name. It didn't work out. That doesn't mean that every proven name in college football won't work out. But maybe that'll send us in a different direction that Tennessee went down with a group of five head coach that had a really exciting offense that they believed in and was young and could be the head coach for the next 10, 20, 25 years. And that's Mm -hmm. proven to be successful. There there is no proven path to finding the right head coach. If there was, everyone would have the right head coach. It's just identifying where your program is right now. You know, the willingness and the desire to recruit. That's always what I worry about with NFL head coaches or NFL Mm -hmm. coaches in general is in the NFL. I don't say I'm not saying their jobs are easy by any means because they're damn difficult jobs, but you aren't traveling across the country and sitting down in the living rooms of 15, 16, 17 year old kids. And and in the months of, you know, May through August, you're trying to sell your program to a five-star recruit. You don't do that in the NFL. That's a lot of work to undertake as a college football head coach. If you don't want to do that, you're not going to be very successful. Maybe a Dan Campbell or even a Dan Quinn would love to do that. Jimbo loved to recruit. Dan Nick Quinn's Saban an interesting loves name. Loves to recruit. Dan Quinn, I do think, is an interesting name. Dan Quinn's an interesting name with some college background. Another guy that I, someone sent me that I, you know, I'm like, eh, you know, I, it caught my eye was, uh, you know, Todd Munkin and what he did at Georgia with Stetson Bennett and the two national titles. And now he's doing uh, up at Baltimore, you know, with the Ravens and the OC. It was it was certainly something that, you know, you go, okay, like if you're looking for an off the radar NFL name, I think Dan Quinn and, and Monk and our guys. Um one guy everybody talks about here on, on all the AM message boards, and I'm gonna just crush their souls right now, is they keep talking about Glenn Schumann, the 33 year old DC at Georgia. And uh I don't think you're gonna see AM look in that direction at all. I mean, it, he's he's very young. Everybody thinks he's Dan Lanning. They're completely different personalities. AM fans have jumped on this. They, they they know nothing about him other than he's the DC at Georgia um, in terms of personality. Um, how much is Will Muschamp affecting and, and helping him along the way right now? Nobody's and asking how much that question. Is the the amount of five stars that Georgia yeah. has affecting that, which I, yeah. I never want to hold having so, a good team against a coach, but Ed Orgeron was able to win a national championship because he had really great talent, not because he was a great coach. He's a stud. He's a stud. But I think the the consensus out of Athens and other places is like, not yet. You know, not not yet. 33. That's what I feel about Dion as well. Dion, he brought Colorado back from the depths. He made Mm -hmm. Colorado relevant again. But when you come to Texas A&M, the expectation is national championship. 
The expectation isn't you find a few slam dunks in the transfer portal and you win a few games that you weren't supposed to win. No, 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 no. It's national championship. Yeah. Can Deion Sanders win a national championship in college football? Maybe. I just don't know that yet. Caro, let's move on real quickly because I know we've got a role and we'd spent most of this time talking about AM, but it was the biggest news um, in college football this weekend outside of, Massive you know, news. alongside of the Jim Harbaugh stuff. But real quickly, LSU, another, you know, they always play wild ones against Florida, but they held on one like they were supposed to. But the real story is Jaden Daniels. He comes back from that that vicious hit against uh, Alabama, is on the field playing the next week. Lord knows they needed him in his 600 yards of offense and whatever it was he did. If that wasn't a Heisman performance, I don't know what is. I know Penix and Knicks up there in the Pacific Northwest are are going to be tough to beat, particularly if Penix leads them to an undefeated uh, season up there in Seattle. But damn, if if I'm watching, Jaden Daniels is the most outstanding player in college football in 2023, and there's no way on God's green earth you could tell me otherwise. And if with that defense, Caroline, I don't know if LSU would go to a bowl game if they had an average SEC quarterback right now. I would 100% agree that Jaden Daniels is the reason why LSU has even been nationally relevant, to be completely honest with you. Mm -hmm. And I had always, you know, made the campaign for Jaden Daniels to be the Heisman Trophy winner, probably looking through a little bit of my purple and gold glasses. And after LSU lost to Alabama, I thought that probably, you know, probably takes his, his Heisman away, but maybe he'll still get an invite to New York City. I, t- I bite my tongue. I take back everything that I said mm-hmm. after that Alabama game. I don't know how you can see what he did against Florida, even in a loss, what he did against Alabama, even in a loss, what he did against Ole Miss, what he did at Missouri, essentially yeah. taking the entire team on his back with a broken rib and yep. not say that 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 is the Heisman Trophy winner. And I think that the Heisman Trust probably wants to be a little bit careful about labeling that award that that is an elite fraternity that goes to the best player in college football. I think they want to deter it from being an award for the quarterback of the best team in the country. Because if it was the quarterback of the best team in the country, give it to Bo Nix. Give it to Michael Penix. It reminds me. It reminds me. And look, Nix and Penix are doing enough that They've had a great it certainly you, taking they could nothing have, away from them. And that I think is Jaden Daniels problem is they could, they they're kind of doing both over there. It's best team and best player, but I'm just watching football with my eyes, man. And that dude's the best he's, player. He's special. It reminds me. Yeah. It reminds me of R, RG three, the year he was at Baylor. He came to Kyle field and lost by like 24 points to a, a, an average A&M team still won the Heisman. I mean, because he deserved it. He was incredible uh, that season. But his last game before the, the trophies presented is going to be against a really good A&M defense, but that that one that is susceptible in the secondary. So that's going to be an interesting, like, uh, something's got to give. We're running out of time on Dalton's recording. So real quickly, two things I want to get your take on. Yep. Can we stop? Doubting Alabama, and is Jalen Milrow the most improved player in college football from the beginning of the year till now? And then secondly, Georgia moves up to number one. Has there been any – that football team is starting to look like the juggernaut again after, you know, a slower start to the season. It's funny that here we are and it's Georgia-Bama again. It is funny after the beginning of the season when the SEC felt like it was completely up in the air where both Georgia and Alabama looked like they were beatable teams and there they are in Atlanta. Um, But I think that's a credit to those coaching jobs. I think Mm -hmm. that this is the best coaching job that Nick Saban has done probably in his career at Alabama. Because think back a couple of months ago, we didn't know who Alabama's quarterback was going to be. They lost by double digits to Texas at home, and they didn't even really look that good in the process. Jalen Milrow couldn't throw the ball downfield without yeah. throwing an interception, essentially. No All he really had was the long ball in his legs. Now look at Jalen Milrow. He scored six touchdowns against Kentucky. And I understand 
that's a Kentucky team that's probably middle of the road, kind of a 500 mm-hmm. team, but that's a tough Kentucky defense. That Jalen Milrow was able to do that without Jermaine Burton, but was able to do it injured. I've been so impressed with Jalen Milrow in this Alabama team as a whole, an Alabama team that I thought could have lost four SEC games on their schedule. Yeah. Here they are in Atlanta. I've been so impressed by Nick Saban and the Georgia side of things. Look, we're not that far removed from them trailing to South Carolina at halftime. Mm-hmm. We're not that far removed from, you know, Brock Bauer's heroics in a last minute touchdown to beat Auburn. And yeah. here they are blowing out a top 15 Ole Miss team. And yeah. yeah, Ole Miss was able to go down the field early in the game, and I'll give them credit for that. But after the first quarter, it wasn't really even that close. No. George just absolutely dominated. And every single week, that offense gets better. Carson Beck gets better. And Georgia now feels like they're healthy enough, healthier than maybe they've been all season long. And now that all of these pieces are coming together, it's like, okay, all right. Yeah, that team that we thought could potentially have the ability to three-peat, Looks like they can, which is crazy that they have a new quarterback and a new offensive coordinator, and they've lost so much of their defensive talent and depth to the NFL, and they still look like the favorite to win the college football playoff. Credit to Saban, credit to Kirby. We knew they were damn good coaches, but they've some pretty impressive coaching jobs this season. So in in closing, one thing, first first and foremost, Tennessee – they, yeah. Eli Drinkwitz is my SEC coach of the year. No offense to Kirby or Nick. That's my coach of the year, and, and, and there, there ain't a close second. But he dusted Josh Heupel in Tennessee. And Tennessee went, down, Tennessee went down to Florida and lost. And Tennessee's big win really right now is against an A&M team that fired a coach a couple weeks later. How would you rate year two under, Tennessee, under Josh Heupel? Give me that in about... 30 seconds or less. Cause then I want to close. Cause I, we're up against the clock and so are you give me yeah. in one minute, tell me Tennessee. And then I, is there any world you see them being able to, you know, knock off and up, you know, shake up the college football world this weekend in Knoxville, like they did a year ago around this time. And then the final part I've got for you is uh, Sam Pittman. Is he coaching Arkansas next year? Uh, take those two and, and close us out, Caroline. Absolutely no shot that Tennessee beats Georgia this weekend. Tennessee's trending down. I think Georgia's trending up. Tennessee does play better at home. There Mm -hmm. are two different teams at home and on the road. Yeah. But I think that at the quarterback position, advantage Georgia. Defensively, even though Tennessee is a damn good defense, advantage Georgia. Coaching advantage Georgia. Georgia. So I think that Tennessee is going to be able to make things at least a little bit interesting just because it is at home. And that is a tough place to play as Aggie fans know and have experienced no shot that they beat them this weekend. Uh, This year with Josh Heupel, I think the theme of it is Joe Milton's not Hendon Hooker. And maybe Hendon Hooker carried that team a little bit more than we anticipated last year. Got him ahead of schedule. Yeah. Got him ahead of schedule. Josh Heupel is a fantastic coach and that offense works. They've just got some work to do, uh, mm-hmm. depth offensively, and being able to find that pairing of the great defense they had this year, the great offense they had last year. When you can piece those two things together, Tennessee is a playoff team. Tennessee is a national championship contender. It's year three under Josh Heupel. You're going to have to start piecing those things together there soon. But I think they have the right coaching staff in place, and they're doing the right thing in recruiting that now Tennessee, you know, a team that could barely even make a bowl game just a few years ago. Now they're a top 25 football team. Sammy Pittman. I thought he was safe. I thought he was safe. And, and, you know, Auburn just changed coaches, Mississippi state and A&M essentially out on the same day. It felt like, but one day apart, three of the seven coaches in the sec West have changed in the last calendar year. Thank you so much for watching up to the second college football presented by Academy Sports and Outdoors. I got another one for you next week. We'll see you then.